Forty-five percent, forty-four percent, forty-four percent of those that are from outside the U.S. We are not U.S. church friends. We, a lot of this block of the delegations from outside the U.S. will be from Africa. Over thirty percent of the delegates at the next general conference in Portland, Oregon, will be from Africa. The next biggest group from outside the U.S. is from the Philippines, and the third is from Europe. And that's where we exist outside the United States. We do not have United Methodist churches in South America. One of the general conference gets together once every four years. They vote primarily on three things. <clears throat> One is a budget. We have to function as a church by having a budget and where the money comes from there. If you know the church is like this, this is where shared giving goes is what we're doing away from Lake Mills. <clears throat> the second two places that they vote on every time that we're there is the Book of Discipline and the Book of Resolutions. For several, right? That's all that one is going to do that. Here's the difference. The Book of Discipline is our Book of Church Law. This is what tells us how we're going to be organizing as local United Methodist churches. This is, tells us how it is that pastors like Ed and myself can get credentialed and be ministers in United Methodist Church. This is what tells us if somebody has some misconduct, what we do about that. This is what tells us how we're going to be organized for global ministry and all the other things that make us a United Methodist Church. The second thing that they pass is what's called the Book of Resolutions. This is our book of teaching. This is our official stances on various issues as United Methodist. The way this works, when a resolution is passed, it is in effect for two four-year cycles. So we'll pass some resolutions in 2016, those will go in effect as of January 1st of 2017. They'll go for one four-year cycle, then a second four-year cycle. Then they go away unless somebody brings forth the same resolution again or a similar resolution to a general conference and says we need to pass this one again for this, this, and this reason. <clears throat> okay? So this is a teaching book. This is our equivalent of the Pope making a statement on climate change. And we do it through our book of resolutions. And so that's what we're going to look at today are several of the resolutions that deal with climate change issues. And now, we do not have a resolution that neatly packages together one resolution that would work for a climate Sunday at a local church. The field is so good. There's so many different topics that we're talking about that relate to climate change and impact we have on our environment. So I'm going to have you open up the handouts I do. We're going to leave our inside the back page. We're going to slowly work through this. This is um, photocopies of all the areas from the book of resolutions. And then we can leave you do this for teaching. He wants to publish a book, word it in there, then I've got to get permission. But for teaching purposes, on the folks of the teachers, no less, you can still take small excerpts and use it for teaching purposes. Um, we have split up the, um, the, resolu or the um, resolutions on various things in the various subject matters. And the book resolutions was redone this last time. What they very wisely did was take a teaching on a bigger topic and then follow it on the resolution. So, on that. So, the natural world is part of our basic theological understanding of the United Methodist, so how to understand the natural world. What follows this section is several different resolutions that deal directly with the natural world. So, I'll start out by having us look at the beginning of what's marked as paragraph 160. And what those paragraph numbers mean is all through the book of this plan, all through the book of resolutions, there are different paragraphs that deal with different topics. It's kind of a subsection under the chapter is another way to explain it. Um, 
So, how do we start out? And we're talking about the natural world. All creation is the world's. And we are responsible for the ways in which we use and abuse it. Wow. There's a lot of that sucks in there. All creation is the Lord's. And you and I, because we're humanity, we go back for that basis to what? Why do we say that? Why do we be so bold to say we are responsible? Well, who else would be? Can we be Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm looking for is um, being taught probably sometime this fall in Sunday school. Yeah, from the creation. From the creation story. The yeah, the creation story. And, and not meaning to take that creation story literally, that it happened in seven days, the part of that story has always been God was the source of who we are because of the nature of humanity compared to other parts of creation. We have a special responsibility, don't we? When I saw a bike ride on the countryside yesterday, I didn't see some group of cows that had built something like this. <laughs> they are a little bit facetious, but no, humanity has some special skills and graces that other types of creation don't. Water, air, sun, minerals, energy resources, plants, animal life, and space are to be valued and conserved because they are God's creation and not solely because they are useful to human beings. Now let us here old enough to remember those first space flights. Remember those days how heavy that was? And how really heavy it was when we passed and walk and move off. We thought the whole of creation has shifted. Just unheard of. But one of the things we know once we started sending up these graphics and taking pictures up there is wow. Wow. Look at Earth compared to other planets. So when we start talking about space, there's a good reason why, as United Methodists, we recognize that creation is not limited to planet Earth. And what good would it do for us to go to a moon or another planet and do some of that pollution stuff like we've done here on planet Earth? We're recognizing from the get-go we've got some responsibility. God has granted us stewardship of creation. We should meet these stewardship duties through acts of loving care and respect. And when you get home today, you can uh, read through all this either today or uh, sometime later this week. And I invite you to do that seriously. Just take some time to get into this more depth on some of these topics than we'll have time to do today. And the first section under the natural creation is water, air, soil, minerals, and plants. Um, you know, this is a different context teaching here today. And if I was teaching this church at Madison first, or definitely on the west side where Tom Pop is part of the time. Um, we see all this stuff, don't we? Daily. And everything is listed out there. We can't pretend that that's part of it. Um, John would never get any crops if it wasn't for the way we got Next part is energy resources utilization on that page, page 46. And life, big section where we make statements on that. And then we jump to the thing on global climate stewardship, which is the most apropos for our topic for the morning. I invite you to read through. Section D on page 47 of the We acknowledge, in general, uh, we acknowledge the moral impact that humanity has to guide for God's creation, rank and industrialization, 
and the corresponding increase in the use of fossil fuels has led to a buildup of pollutants in the Earth's atmosphere. These greenhouse gas emissions threaten to alter dramatically the Earth's climate for generations to come. This is severe environmental, economic, and social implications. In the adverse impacts of global climate change, this proportionally affects individuals and nations and reduces responsible for emissions. We are in order to support the efforts of all our governments to require mandatory reductions in greenhouse gas emissions and the call of individuals and congregations, their businesses, industries, and communities to reduce their emissions. <coughs> For those that are closest to you, and talk in just a few minutes about what your reaction is to that United Methodist statement within our global church, within our global community that we live in. Right, just for a few minutes, turn to those closest to you. Any observations? Well, what I just was saying that in on page 47, the, 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 the sentence that jumped out at me was the one that said the adverse impacts of global climate change disproportionately affect individuals and nations least responsible for the emissions. I said, you know, I feel good about that. That's kind of sad. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So that just jumped, you know, and John, you said too that a lot of us said that's not a good sentence. And not not there because of its truth or because of it. Well, it's, it's us. us. Yeah. 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 yeah, we're affecting it and we're impacting the people who are least responsible for it. Yeah. And, and I, along that line, I'm, I'm thinking about some um, arguments in, from African countries in particular that say um, they shouldn't have to, they're just getting industrialized and therefore they shouldn't have to meet the lower standards right now because the United States and other um, uh, Western culture countries in particular have had all these years um, to just pollute, 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 and now our industrialization is in our manufacturing is where we want it to be and it's high and they're just getting started so you're telling us we can't pollute? Well, but but still, the people in their countries will suffer. And that's one of the moral dilemmas that we deal with. I mean, one of the big picture macroeconomic questions that is difficult to wrestle with. You know, our standard of living is up here, and as Americans, and so many folks are down here that want up, we've always assumed that they'll come up to our level. Maybe the issue is going to be them coming up and us going down. That's, that's a tough pill to swallow. Tough pill to swallow. Uh, and I'm not advocating that as uh, some kind of trickle out economics or some strange thing like that, but uh, it's a moral reality. And, and we also are, are experiencing right now in terms of global climate issues what happened with the huge spike in manufacturing in China which we personally have felt the impact of in this community as jobs left one overseas and all the pollution that came along with that and now at the top of the spike things are falling off which has another ripple effect I mean all this stuff is interrelated in ways that just scare the bejeebers out of you mm -hmm. if you stop and think about it for five seconds um, well, other comments from the we, I think our group generally agree that greed plays a part in this. And my frustration is hearing people say, we can't afford to address this because we can't raise our energy prices, we can't do this and we can't do that. And my thought is, we can't afford not to. What are we leaving for future generations, for our children and grandchildren, if we don't begin to um, accept some of that and live with the reality of that. Sure. As long as I can remember, gasoline prices have been higher in California than anywhere else in the nation. There's different emission standards on gasoline 
that's manufactured for sale in California. That's why. They, they made a, a state decision decades ago that that was something to do, and they knew the reality out there of what those mountains do to everything west of the mountains. And if you're going to generate a whole bunch of pollution, it's going to get held between the mountains and the ocean. And it's a difficult situation. They still deal with some terrible smoking issues in Los Angeles. And uh, I remember as a youth growing up and reading old Sherlock Holmes stories talking about the smog in London. Remember reading that? Those comments and gold was smog. I think that was really cool. What was the smog? Coal. Coal smog. Coal smog, yeah. I just thought it was some strange variation on the word fog, which it is because it's caused by coal smoke. And when the people in London started catching on to basically they were killing themselves with this stuff, they did something about the coal smoke. Hey, uh, okay, put stuff out that's going to come back. Other, other comments? Yeah, John. Nothing's going to change in this country because of what you said before, the two levels, the lower level of people. Going up there, and we're up there, and we got to go down and meet them. That's never going to happen, not in the United States, because it's up here's profit, down here is you know, If there isn't any profit, it's not going to happen. Sure. It's just yeah, the way it is. It's now, how, how it's happened, John, on some individual levels, and we've seen the reality of this, is good paying jobs in the U.S. have been going down, and lower paying jobs have been taken over for that. Uh, mainly, you don't replace an industrial manufacturing union job with working at Starbucks. They don't replace it in terms of standard living. Um, and that's what's bringing down our standard. And the, the ripple effect on this is it's still not totally played out. It's not played out. Um, so, but yeah, to intentionally make that decision, you're absolutely right. To intentionally make that decision. Other comments? I'm going to jump ahead to page 40, or 54. Resolution on U.S. energy policy and the United Methodist responsibility. Um, Paul had a few words to say that were relevant. Um, they shared with the people in the church in Colossians end of the first paragraph there. We are invited to participate in the preservation and renewal of God's good creation. Mm -hmm. Preservation and renewal of God's good creation. And that's an underlying theme through all the Bible. God's creation is good. Can you imagine being part of a faith that didn't think that God's creation was good? Oh my gosh. What? Is there a faith that believes that? Well, I don't not believe that. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I'm just going to imagine yeah. having that kind of perspective to approach a world of faith that creation wasn't good. I guess if you were part of a religion who was based on trying to figure out everything you could to get off of this planet, yeah. <laughs> but guess what? In our theological understanding, you leave this planet, you just go into another part of God's creation. Right. You're still in God's creation. Yeah, you know, um, what the, the Gnostics, they held that creation was an accident um, and, and that it was evil. And we see that reflected even uh, in our lives today, even though that was an old ancient philosophy, in that where people would see all earthly things as evil. You know, or bad, or not pleasing, even to God, even from Christians themselves, where they they condemn, you know, uh, having a little bit of fun, or or they condemn enjoying yourself out there in nature. I you know, I remember as as the New Age movement uh, uh, came up, all of a sudden, you know, crystals, minerals, <laughs> they come out of the earth were evil, and it's like that's part of God's creation. It's part of the beauty that God has given us. Uh, to, to enjoy and to, 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 you know, to see the glory of God in creation. And yet, it was condemned. Uh, I, I remember that as a child. And, and you know, sort of those, those kind of things, you know, they, they don't outright say it's all bad, 
But they say enough of it is bad to not want to be here. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that reminder. Uh, actually, you were practicing Gnostic at one point. There, for a period of time, there were a few churches oh, there. Wow. Gnostic churches, and uh, Gnosticism was a very interesting uh, belief system that happened in early Christianity, and, and the, one of the essence of it was I understood who Christ was meaning because God had given me that gift and there was only a small number of us who truly mm -hmm. understood the truth. The rest of you folks think you might not might know the truth, but guess what? It's only us who have been enlightened, especially imprinted by God. Um, for a church that's based on the priesthood of all believers, that's kind of really far out there where we all say, I can read scripture and I can personally get meaning out of that without needing to have somebody else tell me that. Now we, yeah, we appreciate people like Edwin who preach for us and help us shape our understanding. But if Edwin on a given Sunday gets up and says something that's just thinking, man, that doesn't resonate with my understanding of the gospel at all, you're free to think that. <laughs> the minute I start saying, I have this special revelation. <laughs> if you give me forty nine ninety five, you'll get it too. Okay. I don't know. We'll probably do the Sunday where I come up and gently grab you by the arm. <laughs> I, I do. I do know a sad story where a pastor, a retired, did have to do that to a pastor who basically had a meltdown at church. Yeah, but so yeah, that shouldn't, shouldn't joke about things like that. Uh, under following Colossians here, um, grounded in a commitment to justice and sustainability. Ah, that's our starting point. What that is saying, that statement, is that United Methodists, our grounding point on this issue is justice and sustainability. General Conference was bold enough to make that statement. Um, United Methodists the world over are called to pursue lifestyles that reflect our concern for God's people and mm -hmm. planet. It's a lifestyle call. Now, I'm very aware that our United Methodist tent is so broad that there's a variety of lifestyles reflected among United Methodists. You know. We're not the Amish. We're not Mennonites. We're not shakers. You know, those groups have very distinctive lifestyles that United Methodists have not been known for. But this is a call for us to sharpen our responsibility um, for these issues. And there are first a series of bullet points that say specifically the United States must. Now, recall again that this was passed within the context of a global gathering who was saying the United States has a special responsibility in our global world because of how much wealth that it has. And this is saying that as Americans we need to move beyond dependence to high carbon fossil fuels that produce emissions leading to climate change. Translated car. Trucks, tractors. That's what it's talking about. You know, we, we have some hybrid cars around, we have some electric cars around, but pretty much we're still dependent on carbon based fossil fuels. Uh, adopt strong global commitments to emission reductions within the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And we have not embraced readily. A lot of things coming out of the United Nations for the last several decades as our country. And so this is a difficult for us to say, well, wait a minute, there is a global uh, governance um, body, for lack of a word, that um, maybe does have something to say to us and does have a broader view than just our parochial vision of the United States. Next bullet point, concentrate on reducing carbon dioxide emissions within the United States and not rely on mechanisms such as emission trading with other countries to meet our targets. You know what that's talking about there? You hear about this? 
a fascinating concept, and what, what this statement is saying may be a fascinating concept, but we're not buying it. What it's saying is we would get X number of emissions on a scale. I don't know what the exact scale is. And if we're going to overdo that through our industrializations, we've got to trade off something else with a country that doesn't have as much industrialization, say Chile. Um, you know, some other country that we would trade these things off of and say, no, that's not the way to approach it. If somebody's not emitting a lot of carbon, you know, that doesn't mean that somebody else should be emitting more. If we're going to talk about this whole globe and the fact that our weather affects the whole globe and what we do here doesn't pay attention to that international boundaries, we need to be responsible within that area where we're at. Reduce our reliance on nuclear power, which is really fascinating because for the longest time that was seen as you know a good alternative. Now, there are some questions about that because of safety issues. And uh, I gotta tell you, it was really disconcerting when I lived for five years within the second tier evacuation zone for the Zion nuclear power plant when I was still on that because we would get yearly in the mail our evacuation directions if there was to be a problem with the Zion nuclear plant. And when you're living a block from Lake Michigan and you know you've got six miles of the city of Kenosha you got to get out of before you can even get to the interstate and by then what it's going to be like you're thinking, I'm dead meat. Yeah, it's going to be just good luck. Something like this happens. So it's, it's scary stuff. Uh, which is part of why the Zion nuclear plant was shut down. They finally realized that having that plant in northeast Illinois was maybe not the brightest idea in the world uh, in terms of safety concerns. Um, manage demand through a high priority <coughs> on conservation and energy efficiency. Shift federal resources, both tax incentives and appropriate dollars away from fossil fuels and toward renewable energy sources such as solar, wind, and biomass. Oh my gosh. I drive out to um, southwest Wisconsin, over in eastern Wisconsin, sections of northern Illinois. These wind farms now, oh my gosh. Now there's some problems with those too, you know. Create some sound issues if people live near them, get upset about and it's kind of tough on migrating birds. It's as an alternative energy source, it's maybe the citizen is a good alternative. Um, support, develop, let's see, uh, support development and utilization of appropriate technologies for small scale decentralized energy systems. You know, I've never done it, but my tax advisor was trying to talk into it at one point. You know, putting on these solar panels on my uh, house roof, just converting my whole house into an energy. And uh, some folks have gotten so efficient about that, they're actually selling power from their homes back onto the grid. They're reversing the power flow. Uh, those things exist. And there's tax incentives right now. That's why she was trying to talk about doing it. If you put one of those babies up on your roof, now you're going to have a roof that's faced the right way and all that sort of stuff. You've got to have some. Yeah. We don't have that in Wisconsin. <laughs> well, uh, my tax advisor in Wisconsin, John. She's using it. So, um, Let's say support, expansion of infrastructure needed for cleaner energy vehicles, public transportation, and ride sharing, and provide necessary support for individuals, families, and communities adversely affected by a transition away from fossil fuels. In other words, if we're going to start disrupting folks, we need to figure out ways of society to help folks see those transition. Uh, we all get led to our various jobs. And uh, you're part of an industry that's manufacturing <coughs> internal combustion engines, and we say, oh, we're going to cut down on the number of internal combustion engines. That's what that's talking about, is help people transition to it. Um, some of the folks that really, well, never mind, I'll go there. No. There's this next series of bullets here, starting uh, under, uh, as a Reflection of our call to the caregivers of God that Earth, United Methodist should educate our congregations, conduct an energy audit, replace incandescent 
light bulbs, expand our use of public transportation, choose a cleaner vehicle, and it goes up on the next page, study the consequences of our consumer choices, and advocate for policies that respond to the growing threat of climate change. Those are, those are calls for individual action. So I want to have you talk again to the folks closest to you about what are some of those things that I can do? Oh my gosh, uh, how could I possibly do that? Okay, let's just talk a few minutes, sir. I'm going to do a quick run through the, the rest of these just so you got a notion of what's happening on the topics. Um, page 56 is a whole resolution on nuclear safety in the United States. And we'll jump forward on that to page 67. Environmental justice for a sustainable future. Concept. We're going to have justice, but we're going to have a future that's sustainable. Uh -huh. Then we jump ahead with several sections under there. To, uh, that one is calling for several folks to do things, including on page 72, call specific for uh, local congregations to develop programs, incorporate the concerns of ecological justice into our work on social concerns, mission activities, stewardship, trustees, and worship. Now, in other words, integrate this into all that we do. This becomes just part and parcel of what it's about. Um, page 72, um, resolution on environmental law, Cautionary principle. And we'll put a section on that when we flip to the next page. And we've got a whole resolution on environmental stewardship. Um, which when you jump to page 83, one thing that jumped out at me as I was getting ready for the day was number one, right to live in a community free of toxic and hazardous substances. Um, being one of those people who lives in a home within about two miles of the pipeline expansion, uh, that's a real sensitive issue for me these days. Um, and we jumped through all those different topics on that. Yeah, the last one is on page 88. Law of the, the law of the sea and the protection of water, followed by on page 92, resolution on global warming. And in the last section on that, on page 94. If you go through all these therefore and therefores, be it resolved that as a global church community, we call on our members to reduce human-related outputs of greenhouse gases, and be it further resolved that members should make an effort to learn about human production and release of greenhouse gases and evaluate their own lifestyles, to identify areas where reductions in production and release of greenhouse gases can be made, there are many informative resources for learning how we can reduce our greenhouse gas impact. And be it further resolved that members should also work to make their own congregations more aware of the issue of global warming. Be it resolved that members call on the nations of the world to require reductions in greenhouse emissions. And be it finally be it resolved that members should also attempt to educate others outside of their church communities on the need to take action on this issue. Today is, is just one step in that educational process. That's what today's about. We have to be informed about it. I'm going to wrap up with, with two things here. I'm going to pass this around while we're finishing up. For those who are interested in really, really digging in on this issue, um, University of Wisconsin is offering one of its massive open online courses, better known as MOOCs. <laughs> where you can do an online course on climate change policy and public health, which will be going on stuck in November. I've never done one of these, but apparently for those who uh, enjoy that kind of online learning, they're, they're very effective ways to take advantage of resources at the University of Wisconsin. If you go under uh, 
University of Wisconsin, I think continuing education, you can pull up information, but this was a, a email I got because of taking some other continuation courses and they were marketing it. I thought it would be appropriate for us today to finish off the class by sharing the uh, social creed of the United Methodist Church. And our concern about the environment is part of that social creed. Social creed uh, first was started in 1908, our history on that goes back to that. It was a general conference in 1908 that passed it. Short, that was in the, what was known at the time as the Methodist Episcopal Church. It was the Northern Church. Shortly after that, the Methodist Episcopal Church South and the Methodist Protestant Church also passed social creeds. This was during the heyday of what was known as the social gospel movement. The most astounding piece of that history to me is after the general conference passed the social creed, the first one, he sent a, delega a small delegation of bishops to the White House to meet with Teddy Roosevelt, who welcomed them with open arms to tell him about what the Methodist had just done. Can you imagine now a group of Methodists trying to get that kind of audience from the president? Uh, they were glad to receive these Methodist bishops. Um, the Social Creed has been revised a number of times over the years. This is the most recent revision of it. And uh, share the other, the top section of the handout. Turn in with me. We believe in God, created in the world. And in Jesus Christ, the redeemer of our creation, we believe in the Holy Spirit, through whom we acknowledge God's gifts, and we repent of our sin in misusing these gifts to our idolatry sins. We affirm the natural world as God's handiwork, and dedicate ourselves to the preservation and enhancement and faithful use by humankind. We joyfully receive for ourselves and others. The blessings of community, sexuality, marriage, and family. To commit ourselves to the rights of men, women, children, youth, young adults, the aging, and people with disabilities. To improve the quality of our lives and to the rights and dignity of all persons. We believe in the right and duty of our persons to work for the glory of God and the good of ourselves and our lives. And the protection of the welfare is so doing. The rights of poverty, trust, and self, the right of bargaining, and responsible consumption, and the elimination of economic and social distress. We dedicate ourselves to peace throughout the world, to the rule of justice and law among the nations, and to individuals and freedom for all people in the world. We believe in the present and the final triumph of God's glory in human affairs. And we gladly accept our commission to manifest the life of the gospel in the world. Amen. So the current one is pretty heavy on the environment, isn't it? <coughs> the initial one was uh, heaviest on workers' rights back before uh, child labor laws were passed. Past those days, we hope. Don't go back to them. Parts of the world, that's still an issue. It hasn't been in the United States. Yeah. Anyway, thank you for that. And uh, I do invite you to spend more time looking carefully at each one of those resolutions. We weren't going to read them all today. We didn't have the time. But this was to introduce you to the fact that your church does care about a lot of things. By the grace of God, we remain faithful in our life and local congregation. We remain faithful in our witness to the world that we follow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.